backwards. Now, um, regarding the evolution of the landscape of Frathi Cave, uh, during last glacial maximum, the area is severely exposed. This is when the poly landscape is formed. Then, during eight to nine thousand years before present, when sea level was cut. Then, at six thousand years before present, sea level is at uh, minus ten meters, and the sea starts to flood the area. And this is how it looks today. So, um, it, is, it is known, since it is known that marine transgression happened at 6,000 years before present, and by that time the sea level was at 10 meters below present sea level, if we draw the palatial line at that depth, at minus 10 meters, a coastal area, you see the palatial line in, uh, it is the white line, a coastal area is now submerged and this is not very far from the Franchi cave. It is at about 350 meters. And 250 meters from the Lambayana beach, which is another site with very interesting findings. But um, here an interesting problem ar arises. That is that according to the eustatic sea level curves, one should expect the palatial line to be at two up to three meters, not more, uh, below present sea level during that time, during 6,000 years uh, before present. But this is not the case here. The palatial line is at minus 10 meters, leaving, uh, leaving the discussion open uh, for further investigation into important tectonic activity. Thank you. I told you. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's great. Uh, so we have time for uh, questions. Are there any questions? Everything was so clear. You presented was it. it. <laughs> yeah, it was really. It was. Oh, Udi. Yeah. It seems that you have the three meters of the tonnage. It's a little bit louder, please. Can you? Yeah. I understand the right. Uh, if I understand you well. Keep it pushing. It seems that uh, it seems that it was a tectonical. I hear, okay. No, no, say loudly. Ah, you have to touch. You can say loudly. It seems that you have tectonic of three meters. Uh, in the last it, it must be actually a little bit more a little bit more at least yeah. okay yeah. so did you find any evidence for the mis5 uh, deposit in higher elevation no that was actually a survey for the low stand periods low stand okay thank you low stand periods. Good. yes my colleague wants to say something <laughs> who is raising the hand uh, okay Dimitri. Right. Yeah, well, uh, uh, there are some remains of the MIS-5E, uh, well, potential, we think that it is MIS-5E, and it's at about two meters uh, above sea level. But note that these are different places, that means that the, the submerged findings may be at a different tectonic block from the one that we have found the MIS-5, so they may have a different history in terms of vertical movements. Just one more question, please. Dimitri, can you pass him the... Uh... Yeah, sorry. A uh, simple question by a classicist who had to teach Greek prehistory uh, and realized that this was not just the Mycenaean period. Uh, we read the reports on Frathi Cave, etc. Does your work change at all 
the conclusions of the publication of the Frakti Cave. Mm, sorry, can I, didn't, I didn't get that. Sorry. If you change any uh, previous uh, conclusions about the Frangetti Caves? I'm research. not aware so much about previous research on Frakti. Actually, if I can uh, answer, uh, there is a lot of work which has been done from the uh, American team in the 60s and 70s. They did a very pioneering work at that time. We have refined their findings. We have more accurate and, and high resolution data, but what the work that they did was extraordinary. I mean, there, there was, we find very similar things at the place where they did it, with the very simple methods they used, they used at that time. And that was really uh, extraordinary for that time. Okay, that's it. I think she <laughs> she did great. So okay. she did <laughs> exactly. Thanks a lot. Okay, we will continue on to the second one. Matteo Gianni, I hope I pronounce it properly. You'll pr you'll present the uh, title of yours if you like. Great. Okay, so you have to, to, to uh, exactly, and the second one, okay, close it, okay. and you are here. Perfect, thanks. Do you have a pointer? Do you have a pointer? Let me go and ask, and ask. but it's not uh, mm -hmm. because they are uh, working with the cursor. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're using the cursor, but. Just, uh, no. it's not, uh, sorry, just one minute, it's not yet on the screen. Maybe. Uh, what do you have to push? First screen mode yet. First screen, I should. Let's see, no. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe, yes. But it should have shown the whole window. The technique is coming. I think here it is. Okay. <laughs> ah, so it's not PowerPoint. Um, so, so maybe it's not. Uh, this is a. Defined well yes, as a. Yes. Uh, we need um, <laughs> the PowerPoint. Just a second. Uh, I, I have a bit on my own. Good morning to everybody. I'm very happy to be here to present you my research and I would like to thank uh, the organizers and the chairperson who gave me, gave me the opportunity to be here. So I will uh, present you a part of my uh, PhD thesis that I defend, defended uh, about one year ago in aix marseille University. Um, I will focus on the coastal paleo-environment of the Roman city of, Mayor, of uh, Polentia, situated in the uh, Balearic Archipelago in Mallorca. Uh, my objective was to test uh, the hypothesis of uh, the arbor location in a paleo-lagoon uh, at the foot of the city. 
So the Balearic Archipelago is situated in the center of the Western Mediterranean, Mediterranean Basin uh, with the rest of the Balearic Island uh, here. It constitutes the emerged part of the uh, Balearic promontory, promontory extending from the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and due to its superficie, Mallorca is the seventh island of the Mediterranean. The island of Mallorca is composed of three main uh, geomorphological units, resulting from a complex geological structure characterized by a set of host and grabens in a southwest northeast direction. The host in blue form the mountain, mountain ridge with the Serra de Tramontana to the north and the Serra de Levant to the south and some of the central relief of the island. Uh, the central depression, so-called Espla, uh, consists of in an extensive area located between the two main ridges. So the Mallorcan coastline is in a larger part, part composed of uh, rocky coast, around 80%, illustrated by the steep rocky coast on the seaward margin of the two horsts. Uh, and the low cliff here of the platform of Migjon to the south. The third type of coast, represented by the large bays of Palma, Polenza, and Alcudia, uh, is characteristic of uh, grabens uh, happen to the sea. The scarcity of this low coast, uh, easy to reach, concentrated the human uh, occupation uh, of the island on restricted area like Alcudia and Polenza bays here, where the Roman city of Polentia was located. Uh, in fact, these spaces uh, provided uh, privileged mooring areas for ancient population. So we go to uh, the Bay of Alcudia. Uh, it is an important part of the low coast of Mallorca. It's composed of large sandy beaches, uh, largely formed by biogenic sand. The bay has a structural origin and is delimited by two Mesozoic scarps uh, along normal folds. The, uh, the bay can be divided in two uh, subsections, a uh, southern part characterized by an alternation of uh, sandy beaches and pleo pliocene uh, uh, rocky coast, uh, eolianite, surrounding a uh, dune field partially fortified by a pine forest, while the northern part is formed by a beach dune system protecting a humid zone backward, especially the humid uh, protected zone of Salbufera. The bathymetry of the bay is characterized by depth of 30-35 cm in the central part, while it is much less deeper and irregular in the northern part. <laughs> this uh, north-south distinction is also perceptible in the hydrodynamic of the bay. Uh, even if the sediment is transported by a longshore drift, we can see two uh, littoral cells. The small uh, littoral cell uh, in the southern part of the bay, drives sediment to the south, and the north, uh, largest northern littoral cell drives sediment to the north. So the Roman city of Polentia was uh, founded here, uh, near the medieval uh, town of Alcudia, and the present town of Alcudia, uh, at uh, the foot of a rocky promontory, uh, and it is protected from the prevailing winds uh, coming from the north. So a few words about the history of Polentia. Uh, the city uh, was created after the Roman conquest uh, of the Balearic Archipelago by the consul Caecilius Metellus Balearicus in 123 BC uh, in a previous uh, indigenous settlement. From an archaeological perspective, uh, the earliest structure in the forum are dated to the 1760s BC. A second phase of construction took place at the end of the second century AD or at the beginning of the third century AD. Um, after a period of trouble uh, at the end of the third century AD, the city was partially uh, destroyed by a fire, especially the commercial district of the Forum. Through traumatic, this uh, destruction not drives uh, people uh, from Polentia and it survived into the Vandal, Byzantine and Islamic period but in a, a progressive process of decline and abandonment until its complete disappearance uh, in uh, 1300 uh, AD. 
so, uh, as I told you, my objective was to locate uh, one of the harbors of the city. The city is supposed to have uh, two or three harbors. So, the big harbor, um, Portus Mayor to the south of uh, the city, opening onto the Bay of Alcudia, another smallest harbor to the north. Uh, in the southern part of the Bay of Polentia, and possibly a third uh, harbor, uh, Uta Harbor, near the Alcanada Islet here. So my work is based on the study of uh, sedimentary uh, cores drilled in the coastal plain near, uh, near Polentia. I studied the grain size uh, and the faunal content, content especially the ostracods and uh, the macrofauna. So uh, on this map, you can see the location of the core uh, we drilled uh, in, uh, in Polentia. I will focus uh, first on core Pol 3 here, because uh, the core underscores the uh, general evolution of the lagoon, and it is the core that shows possible uh, human impacts. Uh, you can see the C14 date, the log, and uh, the results of the fauna. I also did some statistics on the faunal data. Here you can see an axis of the PCA that shows the opening or the closure of the lagoon. So at the base of the core here, uh, I identified a sandy unit deposited between, uh, with a lot of Posidonia uh, remains deposited between 2000 BC and 1. 1,500 uh, BC. The fauna is characteristic of an open lagoon uh, environment because uh, we have a mixing between, uh, between uh, coastal species, marine species, and lagoonal species. Around 1.5 meter uh, below present sea level, I note a sharp transition in the ecology of uh, the ostracod and the macrofauna. And uh, the unit B is characteristic of uh, a lagoon uh, with typical uh, lagoonal species such as Cyprida historosa for the ostracod, Serastoderma, Loripes, and Hydrobia for the macrofauna. So we know that when the Roman, uh, so this uh, transition uh, appears between uh, 1500 BC and the first century uh, BC. So we know that when the, the Romans arrived in Polentia in 123 BC, they found a, a lagoon. This uh, lagoon seems to persist until the 10th century uh, AD, even if we need more C14 dates to fix this date. Uh, and at the top of the core, we note the uh, complete closure of, uh, of the lagoon with the disappearance of ostracods and uh, a decrease in the density uh, of the macrofauna. So, um, I will show you uh, the results of another core, the core Pol 10, that it was drilled uh, at the uh, eastern uh, part uh, of the Paleo Lagoon. I will not go into details concerning the deepest uh, unit of, uh, of the core because they are uh, older than the Roman period, but uh, the unit D uh, here is interesting because um, the molluscan assemblage is dominated uh, by, uh, by the snail species Myosotella myosotis, that it is a well adapted species to supratidal uh, environments and coastal fringe and can, can tolerate Right, sorry, fresh to fresh to polyaline waters. The association of these mollusks with the Ostracod Sarsipridopsis aculeata shows the presence of um, of an environment that is not perman permanently inundated. So we know that in uh, in Roman times, this part of the lagoon start to be uh, silted. So, by means of drilling the operation and archaeological excavation, we have been able to reconstruct the geomorphology of the lagoon in uh, uh, 2,000 years ago. So, uh, this lagoon extends at the foot of the city. Here you can see the main uh, building uh, of, the, of Polentia. Uh, uh, archaeological excavation... Uh, <coughs> Uh, a necropolis uh, funded, uh, discovered during uh, archaeological excavation allows us to locate the sand spit here. Uh, the inlet connect, uh, connecting this, the lagoon with the sea 
is uh, difficult to find, but I propose here a location based on its current location. And uh, the inlet was already present in uh, 18th century maps. Uh, archaeologists uh, discovered uh, also a lot of uh, ceramics uh, with marine incrustation near the necropolis and uh, near the core pol 6b. So uh, we know uh, that uh, the lagoon was present when the Romans arrived, and such water bodies are particularly attractive for ancient population because uh, they are naturally protected. However, lagoons are also uh, particularly uh, restrictive, first for the accessibility because of the mobility of the inlet, but also uh, because the water depth is, uh, is generally low. And uh, lagoons act as uh, sedimentary traps and could be rapidly infilled when the accommodation space is low, as for Polentia. So in order to know uh, the harbor potentialities of the lagoon, we need to know its depth, so its uh, water column. The sea level position in Roman times uh, in the Balek archipelago is essential in uh, reconstructing the depth of the harbor basin. And presently, there are a paucity of uh, geological or archaeological data uh, in Mallorca in order to constrain the sea level uh, position uh, at that time. So uh, for this reason, you, we used a numerical model to predict relative sea level position uh, during the Roman period. We used an improved um, version of the open, source, open court source Selen uh, that at the scale of the Western Mediterranean uh, gave good, uh, good results. Uh, thanks to this restitution, we saw that the sea level uh, 2,000 years ago in uh, in the Balek Archipelago was lower to 35 centimeters, and it is consistent with uh, data obtained in uh, continental Spain, in Valencia or Barcelona. So uh, I realized an age model on the core pole 3 uh, that shows apparent sedimentation rates, and I have been able to, uh, to uh, distinguish the three main uh, harbor units uh, defined by Mariner and Morange in 2006. So at the base of the core, we can note the pre harbour facies. Uh, it corresponds to the open lagoon phase with high uh, sedimentation rate. Uh, at the base of the harbour facies, you can see an important uh, sedimentary hiatus uh, that dates to, uh, the, to the first uh, century uh, BC between the first century BC and the first century AD, so the, probably the time of uh, harbor foundation, and it could be interpreted as uh, dredging ev evidences uh, in, the, in the lagoon as for uh, many, many other uh, Roman uh, harbor uh, of the Mediterranean. And uh, the low sedimentation rates in uh, the entire uh, Harbour facies could also translate uh, the multiplication of uh, dredging operation in the Roman period. So by means of uh, sea, level, uh, sea level position uh, reconstruction, uh, we have been able to show that the water depth of this lagoon was around one meter. It is small, but it, was, uh, it could be enough for a small boat such as lighter. Uh, the bigger boats uh, were probably uh, located, uh, as I told you, near the Alcanada Islet in the outer harbor, uh, and the Romans carry goods with lighter to the, to the Lagunal Harbor. Thank you. Sorry, me again. Uh, very interesting. I worked with Miguel, Anco, Miguel Angel yes. Cuco, who is a land archaeologist at Polentia. We worked on the rock cut slipway at Can Picafort, a few 12 kilometers east. This is a rock cut slipway with absolutely no dating evidence. It's earlier than modern fishing slipways and it's post prehistoric. There's a wonderful date for you. Uh, our, our feeling was 
that there had just been a slight sea level change. Exactly. I'm very reassured by what you say. And this is, in fact, a fairly... My question, then, is, apart from the fascinating evidence you are provided about water depths in harbours, this is a very important part of the work of your, your colleagues. Uh, the, this coastline east of Polencia is fairly stable, yeah? So yes. what happens in Polencia is valid for the coastline to the east. Is that in your hypothesis? Yeah. In this yeah. part? That's right. Yes, it's uh, really stable. The, the, the speed uh, seems to build before the Roman period uh, in, in, the, in 2000, uh, between 4000 and 2000 BC. Yeah. So it's really, really sure, stable. That's very reassuring for us because we've just published. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's in the Ikova I I five. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. He owes me. No, so George, sorry. It was next time, uh, later. So we have to thank him first. Thank you, Clyde. It was a good talk. He deserves it. A good talk. So, Dimitri, we will go on with you. Um, Dimitrios. Um, is the name? Can you pronounce your phone? I will, I will do it. Though. You'll do it yeah, do better it. than me for sure. <laughs> okay. Sorry, with the Greek names. Oh, thanks a lot. That's a lot of help. Okay, just, uh, just the front of the pointer itself. You can use it if you uh, like. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Secularity. Secularity. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is this? Uh, this. Okay. It's okay. Oh, it's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dorothy. You know, Greeks are rich men, so they were able to buy long names <laughs> before the crisis. <laughs> <laughs> so my surname is Sakelariu. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, okay. This is uh, uh, results from a joint a collaborative work between the University of Crete and the Hellenic Center for Marine Research. And the aim was to understand prehistory and prehistoric submerged landscapes in the Ionian Sea. So we are back again from the Western Mediterranean to the Eastern one. And uh, the particular study area is the, uh, Ionian, the inner Ionian Sea archipelago. Uh, it's uh, a, kind, a kind of 20, 25 uh, uh, small and bigger uh, islands and islets uh, of the western coast of mainland of central Greece. And uh, on the picture, on, the, on your left side, uh, uh, in the bottom, you see what is uh, the, uh, the view from uh, uh, the southernmost tip of uh, Meganesi Island, which is uh, this island here. So what we see towards south is firstly this small island of Kithros, it's this one here. Then further south we see Atokos, which is this one there. And in the, in the further background we see Ithaki, Ithaka, this island. So it's an area with a lot of islands, it's a protected sea and enclosed in, uh, from the open ocean. So uh, the initial phase was a, a surface survey to, uh, for the prehistory uh, of the area, uh, and the aim was to understand the, the human uh, presence in, in, in the area of the Inner Ionian Sea Archipelago and the relation with the smaller uh, islands. Then we may also uh, uh, have some evidence for early seafaring in, a, in an area which, as we said, it is a protected one, and you can see the opposite shore, so it's easy to think, at least, to go over there. Uh, even if you have to cross some narrow sea straits. And uh, then, uh, okay, the, the research was focused on this, uh, um, on the four islands I mentioned below and so here. So it's Meganesi, Kithros, Atokos, and Tarkudi, which seems to be isolated. But also, uh, the, the initial thought was also that there were fragments of uh, previous of a Pleistocene uh, landscape. So the surface finds uh, documented the diachronic occupation of this area from the Middle Paleolithic until the Roman times. So this is what 
surveys, archaeological survey uh, provided, and also it was particularly focused on this small island of Kithros. This is Kithros here, and it's a, a coastal cave in, in the northeastern part, uh, sorry, northwestern part of Kithros. This is the photo of, of the area with the cave which uh, yield um, Middle Paleolithic uh, lithic artifacts and final, final remains left behind by the Neanderthals. Uh, so this, according to Nena, the archaeologist of the group, is uh, uh, the first uh, time that this constitutes uh, a closed and datable uh, assemblage uh, for the Paleolithic in the uh, in Ionian Sea. Then the questions which arise are whether the Neanderthal groups came for, by following a terrestrial road or a coastal or marine uh, route to arrive there. And uh, regarding uh, the cave itself, if this karstic complex also continues uh, below the sea level, the present sea level. And this is where the Hellenic Center for Marine comes to survey the underwater part of the, of the area, both here in Kithros, but also the entire uh, inner Ionian Sea archipelago. So we'll start with the Githros findings and, and uh, data we collected. So here you see the, the outline of Kithros Island, and what is surrounded is actually the mosaic of the site scan sonar survey we conducted around uh, the island in order to see what is below the sea level, if there are caves, etc., etc. So as we said, the uh, cave was located on the northwestern side of the island, and this is on top, it's a zoom, um, a zoom in. Of, of this area here, with the cave over here. So this shows a nice sloping seabed, rocky seabed, uh, just off the shoreline. We also see a flat, sandy area here, uh, with different acoustic uh, um, characteristics from the rest of the, of the seabed. But this is not a high-resolution image that the archaeologists need. Uh, so what we did, we focused on this area and we uh, conducted a stereogrammetry, stereogrammetric documentation of the area, both onshore and offshore, and you see the composite uh, uh, stereo photogra photogrammetric result of this area there, with, with the onshore part, yeah, with the onshore part here, and the offshore part over there. No further results from this part of the survey yet, this is an ongoing research, so let's go back to the big uh, picture. The black lines show the grid of the seismic lines that we performed in the area of the Inner Ionian Sea Archipelago. Uh, this survey was not as fancy as the one in Frathi that Alessandra uh, um, presented previously because the budget was lower, so we had to restrict ourselves to basic seismic profiling. And uh, we used a nice boat which was offered uh, by the mayor of the island and some of the inhabitants, and we used a boomer. Uh, a sub-bottom profiler, you see the, this is the source of the, the energy source for the boomer profiler, this is the deck unit and this is the current amaranth which, uh, with a with uh, um, source of the sound mounted uh, on that. So, and the aim was to understand how the, the area was looking like during the low sea level stance of, of the upper Pleistocene. Just to refresh our, 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 our memories, uh, when we talk about uh, fluctuation of the sea level, then we have these nice curves. Uh, this is for the first 400,000 years, and then from 400 to 800,000. And you see that the sea fluctuates between the present sea level, which is around zero, plus minus something, and minus 120, minus 130 meters below the present sea level. So this is, the, uh, this is how the sea level moves only because of the eustacy and isostasy, only because uh, what, the sea, what, what the water does and, and the glaciers do, and also what the, the isostatic rebound of the crust does. But, no, not but yet. So, just to have a, a simple drawing, uh, how uh, the, um, the relief is forming during the different sea levels, so what we try to find is to, to have indicators of sea level uh, in, in, on the seafloor. So the, the best indicators are the terraces, either depositional or, or erosional terraces. Let's see how the depositional terraces form uh, uh, at, at the sea level. So we have here a high sea level stand and we have the formation of a deltaic sequence, a pro-delta sequence, a clinoform, as we say, on the high stand. Then when the sea level goes down, 
in the, in the, in the uh, glacial period, we have the formation of a new uh, deposition alteras at minus 120. And then in the next high stand, the, uh, sorry, we have to go forward, yeah. In the next high stand, the next deposition alteras will form at the same level with the previous one and the next low stand terrace at the same level, and so on, and so on. So we have a, a pattern of stacked terraces at the same level, both either high stand or low stand. But the Greek area, Greece and Eastern Mediterranean, is an area which is very active in terms of tectonics and faulting. And this, uh, these are, this is the area of the uh, inner Ionian Sea where we can highlight the major faults. The area is under the influence of this Kefalinia fault. It, it is a major fault. It has uh, produced more than 20 earthquakes with magnitude larger than 7 in the last uh, 50 years. So it's a pretty active area. And the entire area here is under the effect of this uh, uh, fault. And that means that we have vertical tectonic movements. So let's repeat this drawing uh, by introducing the tectonic factor. So we have a fault there. So we have our high stand terrace there, and then our low stand terrace over there. And then again, we have a high stand terrace, but in the meantime, the fault, because of the fault, this area has been uplifted. So the previous terrace is higher than the, the next highest level. And this is the same for the low stand terrace. The previous low stand terrace has subsided, so we have the new one formed on top of that, and so on, and so on, and this is how we arrive with this very nice staircase uh, relief we find in areas which are uh, undergo uplift or subsidence. So keep this in mind because the data confirm this model. So this is a boomer profile uh, from the southern part of, of Lefkada here. And what we see here, we, we see a kind of staircase uh, relief there. And if, if we draw the uh, interpretation of this profile, then what we see is firstly the first clinoform here, which is, can be associated with uh, uh, stage 2, last glacial maximum, and the uh, associated, the depth of the associated sea level is at about 127 meter here. Then we have an evidence, or yeah, not very uh, poor evidence for the stage 4, but we have a, a stage 6 here with a very nice, nicely developed clinoform at stage 6, which is at about 140,000 years. And below that, we have a pretty good evidence for stage 8 at 250,000 years before present. So we have a succession of low stand terraces which are at different depths because of tectonics. So in the, another uh, profile, we see similar things. Look at uh, here, for example. This, this is the uh, left half of this profile. So if we do the drawing, we can again recognize a stage six clinoform here at 220 to 230 meter depth. And we can also see this irregular strong reflector, which points to a terrestrial uh, uh, reflector, which means a terrestrial landscape. And if we transfer this uh, reflector to the upper profile, then we see that these two blocks, probably during the stage eight, were connected with land, there was no sea behind, be, uh, between them. So with data like that, and uh, like this, which I will probably skip by uh, interpreting it because only five minutes are left, uh, we can have uh, good uh, data and evidence on where the sea level was located, uh, or where the sea level, the previous sea levels are located today, but we can then reconstruct how the uh, landscape was before today. So. Firstly, we mapped uh, the active faults, which affect the area and uh, produce the vertical uh, movements. And then we move by uh, um, connecting the different indicators of the sea level of the last glacial maximum, we arrive into this paleogeographic map of the area. And note that the LGM shoreline is not at the same depth everywhere, because the tectonic movements are not same everywhere. So we find, as we say here, we find the shoreline of LGM between 105 and 130 meters below present sea level at different uh, uh, sides of this small area, which means a lot of tectonics is, is active there. And if we go further back in time, in uh, stage 6, 
we find stage 6 shoreline at 214, or between 214 and 253 meters. So something like uh, 120, 130 meters below the LGM shoreline, which means within the period between 140 and 20,000 years, we have a subsidence of about 120 meters. That means about one meter per thousand year mean subsidence of the area. So active tectonics is present. If we wouldn't have considered that, then we would draw the shoreline of state six at the same uh, place where the LGM shoreline is, but this is not the case. And what this shows is that there is a lot of area which was available to the prehistoric humans at that time, and that means that it's a lot of work for the archaeologists underwater. <laughs> so just to summarize the whole thing, so we mapped the active fault of the area, and then we managed uh, to reconstruct the paleo shoreline of the last glacial maximum end of uh, state uh, six, and this yields us data for here, the last glacial maximum, for the state six, and we also, as we said before, we have some data for states eight, but we are not able to trace the shoreline of states eight because of lack of enough data. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this fantastic lecture. Ooh, uh, may I ask how does it relate to possible Neanderthal and uh, let's say lower Paleolithic sea travel as the date given by Strasser to Preveli II is, one, is 130,000 years? Yeah, well, uh, now this is now assumptions. Uh, according to the data that the archaeologist Nenagal Anidu has yielded from the uh, archaeological survey, we have Neanderthal remains in, on this island, on Atokos, which seems to be always island uh, for the last, well, since, MI, since MIS 6, which means for the last 140,000 years, but also for the high stand before, which is seven, so we go back to at least 200,000 years. So this was always island. It may be connected to the sea during stage eight. We, don't, we are not sure. Uh, but this goes back to 250,000 years. And then we don't really know uh, when the Neanderthals came to the island and, and when they came, where was the sea level. I mean, in, in stage eight, this either might be connected or maybe separated from, from the mainland by a very shallow and very narrow strait. So, yeah, from, from this point on, it's your turn. <laughs> Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Great. It means that it was so clear. Everything. Thanks a lot. Oh, it was to geology for the archaeologists. Thanks a lot. Okay, it's time to uh, to ask for talking to Duru. This time I know very well. Very, very good pronunciation. Yeah, <laughs> I practiced it for a long time. <laughs> Great. Okay, so that is the yeah. yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'd like to start thanking the University of Cyprus and North Frost Foundation, and especially Stella and Lucy for this organization, which seems to me like a, a reunion and a comeback, which yeah, guides to hope at least. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Dimitri, may I do your presentation again? <laughs> so, I'm going to talk to you about the submerged city in uh, the island of Crete. Ancient Luz, uh, modern Elunda Bay. I think that there is no need to explain why Crete was uh, crucial on the sea routes of uh, Eastern Mediterranean. It's obvious by its uh, position in the map. And 
there is no need to explain why Minos was the first who established the thalassocracy, as Thucydides informs us. Uh, on the northern side of the island, there are just three natural uh, anchorages, uh, areas uh, offering natural harbors, the Bay of Suda, the coves at the south of the island of Dia, and at the eastern uh, gulf of Merabello, the uh, little, the, the Bay of Olus. Uh, again, you can easily understand why this uh, promontory, the Kolokitha promontory, doesn't work anyway, this is the promontory, uh, why this promontory uh, uh, was inhabited early in uh, uh, early Minoan times because of the natural anchorages that it offers for every weather and also the uh, strategic point that offers the isthmus where the uh, uh, city center of the historical times uh, used to exist, ancient Olus. Uh, in case of any attack, the inhabitants of the city could move either towards Crete or towards the peninsula, and there was sufficient producing land uh, in both east and western of the city to uh, be self-sufficient and, of course, naturally defended. According to archaeological results, the area uh, was uh, inhabited from uh, early Minoan times. Uh, in this area here, uh, many tombs of uh, Minoan, all the Minoan period uh, were found. Uh, the, urban, the urban center was on the isthmus, was, which was, of course, wider at that time. And uh, the abandonment came uh, as the general shape it is in the islands of the Aegean due to Arab invasions in 7th century AD when the coastal cities were abandoned and, uh, and the inhabitants uh, moved towards the mountains. The uh, city of Olus is well uh, followed in, in uh, ancient uh, testimony. Uh, up to the 6th century AD, when uh, Hierocles, author of Synecdemus, uh, refers to the bishopric of Alingos, uh, another uh, way to pronounce the ancient uh, Olus name. And uh, uh, Pseudoskylax, at early at 4th century BC, refers to its harbor, when Stadiasmus in 4th century AD re refers to uh, its harbor and also uh, the fresh water that was exist there. Uh, not any other underwater uh, research took place at the area, no, though we know that there is a submerged city there. There were some investigations of the effort of underwater antiquities, but I didn't manage to locate any reports at the uh, effort archive or anything published. Uh, so, in uh, 2012, uh, 2015, we joined effort with the uh, uh, Institute of Mediterranean Studies, the Geophysicist of the Institute of uh, the Mediterranean Studies, and we spent four days uh, at the area of the Isthmus uh, trying to do our best. Uh, we conducted visual observation to the uh, area depicted on the screen. Uh, also, uh, magnetic radiometry mapping took place in the yellowish areas. When uh, electrical resistivity tomography took place in the gray area. The results, especially of the uh, electrical resistivity tomography, ah, uh, here you have a picture of the magnetic radiometry mapping process uh, with uh, 
Nikos Papadopoulos and uh, Cleanthes Simedanis from uh, Institute of Mediterranean Studies and uh, two uh, volunteer archaeologists, uh, uh, Tariana Frangopoulou and Dimitris Karambas, that was the team. Uh, uh, yeah, here you have uh, a picture of how le, the electrical resistivity tomography uh, was conducted, which gave us the results uh, I show you now, uh, that we have uh, uh, structures from uh, the seabed down to at least two meters, uh, which is an evidence that the, uh, what, what, what's now obvious, apparent on the surface of the seabed, it's just the upper level and we have structures and the previous faces down to two meters below. Uh, the uh, bluish area on, on the screen uh, shows the area where there are uh, structural remains. The reddish uh, lines are uh, where we found uh, defensive structures, uh, two uh, towers at the north and, the, uh, and probably the Hellenistic, the base of the Hellenistic uh, city wall at the south that disappears under a, a mole which is obvious la obviously later. According to just the archaeological uh, factors, we uh, estimate that the uh, ancient uh, shore was where the uh, two lines were just drawn. We have uh, this apparent uh, uh, structures uh, at the area where the uh, Chapel of Analipsy is. Uh, it's probably a building of the last phase, uh, early Byzantine, late Roman, something like that. Uh, at the beginning, we thought that it could be uh, another basilica. There are three at the area, but it is not. It seems like another kind of structure. And in this point, oh, sorry. In, come on. In this point here and here, we have uh, uh, previous phases of the same building. There are walls uh, that are under other walls, the, the ones uh, on top. And uh, we also located a street going uh, among two, these two buildings uh, all the way from one side to the other, a paved street. Here you have a picture of the building. We also located the apse of a basilica uh, on the other side of the uh, Gulf, the, where the submerged city is, which apse seems, uh, we, we uh, uh, took measurements and uh, so, and we also realized that there was again an apse of a previous uh, uh, phase under the one that is on top. And uh, due to magnetic, uh, uh, come on. due to magnetic uh, gradiometry mapping, we are we are able to uh, link the uh, the apse and the uh, joint structures to structures that are not obvious, to walls that are not obvious now. They are under the street and also uh, structures and uh, walls that they are apparent uh, inland. Uh, in this area here, we have uh, buildings with quite elaborate uh, technique and materials. Uh, the channel you see on the map, on the, on the picture, was excavated by the French uh, who were uh, guarding the uh, autonomous Cretan state in uh, 1898, and they recovered uh, several inscriptions from uh, the channel, which means that we, 
there somewhere it's the city center, either the Agora or uh, some important buildings. And this is the picture we have also from the remains. You can see the ashlar blocks here and here and here again. We also located a part of the street I told you before, uh, three uh, other areas with uh, paved street remains. And we know from rescue excavations that another uh, piece of possibly this street uh, uh, located uh, in excavations inland. You can have some pictures of the paved streets. Uh, also on the, uh, on the map, uh, we located uh, two towers uh, north of the uh, surviving isthmus, uh, and you can see the huge ashlar blocks that uh, are the remains of them. On top of the cellular picture, we also imposed the map of uh, Admiral Spratt, uh, who passed from the area in uh, mid-19th century and mapped uh, uh, the whole Crete and also the area of Olus. Uh, he refers to surviving uh, pieces of uh, uh, segments of the city wall inland, probably here, and we really walked around these rubbles and we uh, uh, discovered that there are remains of uh, huge masonry, probably city wall, Hellenistic city wall, uh, under the rubble. Uh, one of the most spectacular finds, though, was uh, the, uh, where the remains of the city wall that it submerged down to uh, two and a half meters, uh, which, as I told you before, uh, it disappears under a mole, which it seems to be later. Uh, we took a series of points and then uh, around the two structures. And you can see that we may have uh, towers, enhancing towers of the, uh, of the wall, or we may need to clean it and find that uh, what we don't see here exists under the sediment. Uh, you can have a picture of how it looks, two uh, rows of uh, big ashlars. You see here how it disappears under the mole, and here it's uh, how the so-called tower looks like. Uh, we managed to do a quick photo mosaic, which is uh, not anything special, of course, for the moment, but it's something. Uh, what is strange are all these holes, uh, these penetrated stones at the two sides of the wall, which I don't really know what, how to uh, interpret it. Uh, it makes me think sometimes that, is it a wall or a mole? I don't know. We need more investigation. and. Uh, that's really our uh, future plan. We managed to secure uh, financing from uh, the uh, municipality of Agios Nikolaos and uh, the support of the uh, community of, of, uh, of the Elundians. Uh, so uh, we uh, admitted uh, to the ministry and we have now a five years uh, project permission to clean, map, and survey the broader uh, gulf of the uh, of Elunda. And uh, we are going to go to the field uh, in 10 days from now. Thank you for your attention.
<laughs> Great, so we do have time for uh, questions from the audience. Are there any questions? <coughs> okay, first, sorry. Mansa uh, Sarmagupi. <laughs> Uh, it's about the, the width is about uh, three meters. There are two uh, blocks, which means one and a half each block by uh, something like 50 centimeters. And we don't know the the, the, um, the height of them. Okay, answer. You wanted to ask also? Uh, right. I just wanted to. Uh Technology makes our uh, life easier. <laughs> Never mind. Say it loudly if possible. <laughs> Yeah, uh, in fact, I cannot answer the question because, uh, okay, there is a natural continuity. I mean, one is on top of the other, but it doesn't mean that the configuration of the, uh, of the coast was the same. I don't know uh, if, if it seems that the mole is later, and uh, if that was a wall, then there was no any reason to have uh, simultaneously a, a mole there, there was no water, and I'm not sure if these penetrated stones are part of a mole or whether they are embedded on the structure, part of the sp structure, or just something that collapsed. We found them uh, at the two sides, they could be just uh, polars to enhance the wall, uh, especially if the wall was uh, mud brick. So, I don't know for the moment. I mean, it's a question. Great. One more and the last one. How deep uh, was the super's uh, sea level in Hellenistic times with respect to uh, the Karadas one? Hmm. This is another interesting question. question. Yeah. Uh, I refer to Hellenistic because of the comparison with the remains uh, at, uh, on, on shore. And uh, because we know not from the, uh, this uh, site itself, but from Hersonisos, some kilometers away, that from Roman times up to today, we have a difference of one meter. So if we are in two and a half meters, then we have to go earlier. That's why I refer to Hellenistic question mark wall. So this is actually, you based your dating on the elevation. Uh, yes, yeah, that's why we, we are referring to geoarchaeological presentation. <laughs> uh, just one, 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 Dimitri, because yeah. I can't refuse Dimitri. <laughs> Thank you, Rodolfo. It seems like it doesn't work. Anyway, uh, we need to be cautious with uh, uh, um, comparing sites along grid. Grid, geologically, is divided into blocks. That means that the Luda may behave differently from Oplos, from Yerapetra, and from Western Greece. So, because from the geological point of view, it's a very, very interesting area, and we do need the archaeological data to date previous sea levels. And that's the geological, yes? Not vice versa. It's a give and give work. Yeah, always. So I would be very cautious to, to compare uh, 
sites between uh, different areas on grid because of the different tectonic systems. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, and uh, we know that especially Eastern Crete uh, are divided in blocks and behave uh, differently. That's, uh, um, uh, that's known. Though we don't have anything else for the moment. So that's the only we have. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot for the third topic. Surprisingly enough, there is no problem for me to, uh, uh, to say, express the name of Gilad Steinberg. We'll give the next talk and he, he will present his subject. <clears throat> Thanks, Dorit. Okay, hello. Uh, again, my name is Gilad and I'm here to present part of my PhD which was recently completed in, in the Department of Maritime Civilization of Haifa University under the supervision of Dorit Sivan and also Justin Dix from South Antium University. In the next 15 minutes, I will discuss um, uh, the impact of uh, settlers on the area around them and how they manipulated the area to suit their economical needs. Um, this investigation was carried out uh, through uh, amalgamation of various methodologies on submerged, uh, not submerged, I'm sorry, on um, uh, anthropogenic markers which are left in the uh, subsurface sediments. Israel, as you probably all know, is located in the southeastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. Its coast is about 190 kilometers long, um, and between 15 to 3 kilometers wide. The coastal sediments which comprises, which, which comprise it are mainly quartz sediments. From um, the middle Holocene, as sea level was beginning to start starting to stabilize, wind and wave derived currents transported these sediments from the Nile to the shores of Israel. From there, they were transported with the wind inland, forming sand sheets and sand dunes which are seen today in this area. Our study area is located in the northern part of this Nile littoral cell. A closer look at the selected sites, you can be see that it is confined between Caesarea in the north and the Hedera stream in the south. It is also confined between the present location of the shoreline and also a Olenite Ridge, which is located about, about a kilometer and a half from, from the present shoreline location. <coughs> the selected sites also have um, uh, sand sheets, which are between two to four meter thick, and also coastal sand dunes. The water table is located between one to two meters below the present surface. Kisari, which is located in the northern part of the study area, was first settled 400 years before the Common Era. Then, uh, from the first century before the Common Era and until the seventh century, it became a provincial metropolis, hosting a population about, for about 35,000 people from the sixth and sixth century. During this period, there was a lively trade passing through it, through its harbor. It was then conquered by the 7th century by the Muslim army. However, there are historical evidence for a, for a significant rise in agriculture, agriculture. Then by 11th century, it was conquered again, only this time by, by the Crusaders. This resulted in a huge decline in its population and also the, its city boundaries. There is a very interesting morphology seen in this area as you can see in this rectified aerial photograph from 1946, before the area was settled, between Kaysara and Hadera stream. It consists of two meter high berms which confined an area of 50 by 50 meters lower plots. Underneath the sand, uh, the sand sediments of the surface, um, a gray sand face is, is identified. It is littered with, with uh, glass remains and also ceramics. By using lithologies from cores which were previously drilled in this area, I was able to map the extent of this gray unit. 
Overall, uh, it stretches out of an area of 1.5 square kilometers. Yusuf Parat, uh, in 1975, proposed that uh, um, this plot and berm morphology are the remains of an ancient Mawasi agriculture. This, this uh, agriculture technique uses the high freshwater table in arid coastal environments to grow, uh, to grow uh, agriculture. However, this hypothesis contains various gaps in knowledge. The gaps are due because this area was never investigated in a thorough geomorphological, sedimentological, and geoarchaeological fashion, and also because the assumptions for the operational characteristics were never verified by hard evidence, and also because of um, um, the identity of the cultivators are not, were not investigated. The main research questions of this research are what anthropogenic signature can be identified in the sediments around Caesarea? And when did anthropogenic impact take place? And the third question is how was the cultivation accomplished considering the nutrient deprived character of the coastal sand? In order to answer these research questions, a multidisciplinary team was established uh, consisting of various researchers. This includes Dorit Sivan and Justin Dix, again, my supervisors, uh, Joe Roskin, Revital Bukman, Ruti Shah Gross, Sael Shalev, Nicholas Waldman, and Isaf Yasur Landau, which all contributed in their research field to this study. In the initial stages of the research, a multidisciplinary database was constructed. It comprised of existing data sets. These include topography, soil maps, historical documentation, and archaeological data. Around 70 boreholes were collected from various agencies um, around the area and inside uh, the study area. And these include ma mainly of lithological uh, data and, of course, existing ages of the stratigraphy. Again, uh, these ages um, dated the, se the sediments inside the study area and also around it. These various data sets were then stored in uh, one database, mainly using ArcGIS technique. Using the lithologies from the existing boreholes, I was able to map through interpolation uh, the extent and also thickness of the gray sediments. I'm presenting it here in this uh, map, and as you can clearly see, it, it reaches thicknesses of up to four meters. Relying upon this map, I chose specific areas to conduct the core drillings. The locations are marked uh, by these circles. And as you can see, they're uh, spread out all across uh, the mapping, the reconstruction of this gray sand faces. In able to extract the, the sediments of the study area, we used a direct push core. Uh, this device enabled us to extract eight meter long boreholes. The boreholes were then transported to Haifa University for magnetic susceptibility analysis. Then they were sectioned lengthwise for color description and also lithological interpretation, which was enabled after I selected samples for particle site distribution, thin sections, FTIR, XRF, inorganic carbon and total organic carbon analysis, and I also selected one sample for OSL dating. <coughs> In this slide, um, I'm presenting uh, graphic logs of the four cores which were drilled uh, in the study area. As you can clearly see, they consist of very similar lithological units. There's a, gray, there's a yellow sand unit on top which covers the gray sand unit, and these two units cover uh, a red loam unit. A comparison between uh, the natural yellow alien sand which sits on top of the study area and the gray uh, unit shows that the gray unit consists of finer gray fractions, higher magnetic susceptibility values, high organic content, it consists presence of phosphate minerals, iron, lead and phosphorus elements, along with presence of ceramic, bones, glass, fetoliths, and ash. These are all missing in the natural yellow alien sediment of the area. 
the presence of, uh, of the organic content and also uh, elevated elemental um, concentrations could be the result of composting practices. The compost itself is a, is a result of an enrichment using uh, urban or domestic refuge uh, to the natural sediments of Kisaria. These various characteristics uh, of, of the sediments and also its spatial extent enable us to hypothesize that um, there was a constant enrichment of the coastal sediments which enabled uh, to, be, to make it suited for agriculture use. After identifying the gray unit as anthropogenic, its time of use was, uh, was verified. This was done by chronostratigraphical correlation, uh, which is presented in, this in these fence diagrams. The chronostratigraphy itself relied on existing and new OSL age ages, which dated the underlying sediments and also the gray anthropogenic sand unit itself. The underlying sediments below the gray anthropogenic sand unit were dated uh, by several OSL ages up in, to, have been, uh, uh, to have been deposited up until the calcolytic period, while the gray anthropogenic sand unit uh, was verified by two uh, ages to, uh, to the Crusader period. You must remember that OSL dates the last time a quartz grain is exposed to sunlight. Thus, we're actually getting the last time uh, this gray pedosediment was used for cultivation. In this methodology, we were able to constrain the gray anthropogenic sand unit between uh, the calcolytic period and the crusader period. In order to better constrain the time of use of the gray pedosediment, we rely upon previously published archaeological artifacts found in the gray pedo sediment and also archaeological and also historical documentation. We relied upon various coins and also pottery artifacts which were both dated to the Islamic times and also on historical description which praised uh, the archaeological productivity of the area surrounding Kisaria for the early Islamic times. In this way, we were able to better constrain the use of the Great Paris sediment to the early Islamic times. So, for conclusion, the subsurface, the subsurface gray sediments covering an area of 1.5 square kilometers from the southern hinterland of Kisaria were identified as agricultural paris sediment that formed during the early Islamic period. The sediment formed by amendment of coastal sand with anthropogenic domestic refuse. These manuring practices enabled a better water retaination of the sandy sediments and higher sediment fertility. This holistic approach that uh, we are presented may offer new possibilities to increase understanding on the impact of human societies on the environment. And if, you are, uh, if, you're, if you're interested uh, to further read of our study, I encourage you to look up our paper, which was previously, previously published in Anthropocene. And I want to, uh, to, to uh, use this opportunity to thank the Hemsley Center uh, Research Center and also the Maurice and Eddie Hutter Fund for funding this research and also these uh, special individuals for helping out in the field and the lab work. Thank you. Any questions? Everything was so clear. No question, no remarks. Well, it means that it was good. Okay, Christophe. Uh, it's very interesting, but why you are not uh, making micropathology of thin section about the <laughs> classes, for example? It can help about Actually, uh, we. Practices and also, if it's agricultural uh, sediments, maybe one day you will be able to find traces of agriculture. Okay, we actually did make some thin sections, and you can see a comparison between the sand units, which is identified on the left side of the screen, to the gray unit. You can see that both of them contain um, quartz grains. Like as we said, it, they, they were um, first they were 
natural island sediments, and then uh, the settlers deposited refuse on them. So you can see around the quartz grain, there is uh, some, like a black uh, silty, they're covered by, by black silt. So this is the difference that we saw in the thin sections. And what was your other question? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, we didn't find. We, we found some some fetoliths which, which were absent, which were absent from the natural sediments of the area. This is what we found. And what is? You can't. We can't. No, you, you, you can't. Is there any more questions? There is one there, the last one. Yes. Do you have any idea about the extension of that gray layer beyond your study area? It's a great question. Actually, right now there is uh, there's some more investigation all across uh, the coastal area of Israel, and you can see where I marked um, with, a, uh, with a red square is all of the areas which are now, uh, were identified as area which were used for early Islamic uh, agriculture, which used the same methodology. Uh, these plots and berm morphology as seen and also the gray sediment is also identified there. This is it. You were prepared for all the questions? <laughs> <laughs> I asked him before to ask. <laughs> That's right. Okay, thanks a lot for Gilad. At the very last moment, George Professor Doro appeared. I pulled the jacket for my good man. <laughs> yeah, I had you know, almost heart attack that you are not uh, showing up. Okay, the last talk will be given by George Professor Doro. Uh, you, can, uh, you have to close it. This one, first of all, close the one right there. here. These are the old, but you didn't know George, so you can yeah. do it as a uh, direct. Yeah. You need any help from Costas? No, 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 no. No help? No. That's your pride. <laughs> With all the technology. There is a screen. This is the screen. Now you're loading it. No. Oh. This happens when you come at the last moment. I apologize. It's fine, it's fine. We, will be, we still do have time. Okay. Here it is. I really apologize. No, no, it's okay. At least you're right. And I'm always glad to see you. So, no questions, no questions for me now. <laughs> okay. Perfect. No, but it's not on the screen yet. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Last talk by George. I truly apologize for this. I'm always last moment person. So, oh, so many friends in the audience. So I, I feel so so nice. So the the title of my presentation is the marine archaeological implication in the Asian Harbor of Biblos and offshore Biblos, Lebanon. And the objective, the main objective of that survey was to reconstruct the paleogeography of the offshore area of Biblos. But my objective is to share our ideas with you. I have more questions than answer. Uh, you know better than me that an extended area of prehistoric landscape is now submerged under the present day sea level. Uh, due to three main factors, static, hydroglacial, isostatic, and tectonic uh, movements. And uh, there are a lot of strong archaeological indication about the subsidence and or the sea level rise, or a combination of two. And in this context, a new scientific field is em emerging, marine archaeology, or archaeological oceanography, as you prefer. This new scientific field actually uses a wide range 
of remote sensor techniques from traditional, let's say, sub-bottom profiling systems, side scan sonar, magnetometer to ROV, even to AUV, autonomous vehicle everywhere, at the surface, under the sea, everywhere in our minds, always in conjunction with the disciplines from the marine sciences and ocean engineering. Generally speaking, there are two main methodological approaches regarding the application of the marine, uh, marine remote sensing techniques in underwater archaeology, which is the main aspect of the marine geoarchaeology. The first is the detection and investigation in detail of ocean shipwreck line on the sea floor, all partly buried in it. This is an example of sites concerned on data. Uh, 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 at the northern part of Corfu, a huge ship uh, separated in three parts, as you can see. Oh, and the second approach is the mapping of submerged sites of archaeological interest within, I mean, submerged ancient cities, settlement ports, and man-made structure. And this second methodological approach leads to paleogeographic reconstruction. This is the amazing example from Alexandria. However, do we have the equipment? Are you sure? Yes, we should. We use all the system to the Biblos project. We use a 3.5 kilohertz bottom profiling, a side scan sonar system, a very uh, nice digital recording unit with a lot of softwares, uh, dig uh, differential GPS and underwater cameras everywhere. We use two different research vessels, let's say a research vessel, a huge one for the deep water up to 150 meters, and a small one, a prototype, as you can see, equipped with uh, very sophisticated sy systems for the, for the shallow water. During the survey period of 2016, you use a, a multi-frequency, very, very high resolution sub-bottom profiler chip chirp type. And this summer, just one month before, at the end of my long Lebanese summer, uh, we survey with this amazing system, interferometric SWAT system, a, a small multi-beam system for a very, very shallow water that provides very dense bathymetric data and at the same time very nice backscatter data, besides Gansona data. So, in the Biblos project, we survey three main uh, areas, a huge one with uh, uh, very dense uh, uh, track lines and two small ones with extremely dense track lines in order to reconstruct in detail the paleogeographic, uh, the paleogeography, the coastal paleogeography of this important area. And of course, we collect a lot of offshore and onshore rock and sediment sampling, uh, samples and among them the dendropoma from the deep uh, submarine um, plateau in the area. However, so based on the collected data and the synthetic interpretation of the bathymetry, site concerned data, subbottom profile data, you can see that the and the submarine environment of offshore biblos is characterized by a unique topography. The submerged landscape is amazing. It is characterized by three plateaus, a shallow one at 25 meters, 28 meters, and the deep one at 31 meters, forming a very nice step-like morphology, which is running almost perpendicular to the present day uh, coastline. And this is the full size consonant mosaic. I'm so proud about this because we have actually this area in our hand. Uh, high reflecti uh, light tones represent uh, high reflectivity, hard substrate, and dark tone represent soft material. So you can see here the three plateaus and the high reflectivity around plateau. This means probably that the plateaus uh, uh, have been decomposed and uh, the fragmentation of this plateau actually uh, feed all the area with hard uh, uh, coarse grain material. And we have the same acoustic signature at the coastal area with the famous coastal plateau of uh, Biblos and between them a huge sediment trap area full of fine grain sediments. So this is the size concerned mosaic for the deep plateau. We strongly suggest and we strongly believe that this plateau is uh, a strong indication of uh, uh, previous sea level 
uh, sea level elevation and uh, is completely flat due to the wave uh, was the, and the wave uh, erosion activity. This is the second one and this is the shallow one. And with the interferometric system, we, this summer, just one month before, we, we map the deep reef and you can see the deep plateau. You can see that it is completely flat but is characterized by an inclination. So that, this means that this plateau can be considered as a tilted block, probably due to the activity of a fault. So we have a very strong indication about the te tectonic activity and the tectonic regime in the area. And of course you can see the fragmentation of the, of the plateau at the western part. And this is the final map with the, with the seafloor characteristics, which is very important for the paleogeographic evolution. And of course, the area between the two high reflectivities uh, regions, we have a lot of fine grain sediments and a lot of targets on the top. You know now better than me that with our system, we can easily detect targets on the, on the uh, soft sediments, but you cannot detect anything on the hard substrate. So we have a lot of targets that we are going to, to grow truth in them in the next period, in the next survey. So let's go to discuss about Biblos paleogeographic implication. And uh, in order to reconstruct the paleogeographic, uh, 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 the paleogeography of, an, uh, of a coastal area, you need only two things. A very detailed bathymetric data and a very nice chronological framework. So we're waiting for actually for our datings, but we use the data from my dear uh, Dorit and uh, oh, of course Labeck and so we produce a very uh, nice estimation of the chronological framework uh, from our area but we have another problem we have a lot of sediments on the top of the sea floor that have been depo uh, deposited the last uh, thousand years what can, can I do so we have to remove them if we want to reconstruct the paleogeography, we have to remove all the sediments, but we can do it very easily. You have to digest the seafloor and the sediments disappear. So after this, this is the paleobathymetry, the bathymetry of the background without the recent sediments. Now we have the paleobathymetry and the chronological framework. It's time to play with the science, because you know that the science is just a game, nothing else. So, let's go back to the Mesolithic period, 2,000 uh, years ago. This is the coastal configuration of the Biblos. We have a plateau, a very nice island plateau, and a very nice peninsula behind the plateau. Let's go back. To 10,000 years. We have some scattered small islands at the front of, of Biblos. 8,000 years. Only three of them. Completely similar with the coastal terraces of Biblos. Uh, you can see them very easily walking at the seaside. And of course, we can go at 2,000 years, which is almost the same topography with the present day topography. Let's focus now to the, to the El Jasmin, Jasmin Bay, which is located here. And according to Martin Francis and Nicola Grima, the old Phoenician harbor is located here. And they have a lot of strong archaeological, geological, and morphological, geomorphological uh, evidences to support this. And our survey further support this scenario. Here is the, a very detailed bathymetry of the Jasmine Bay. And as you know, we can easily remove all the recent sediments to, to, to plot and to map the paleo, the paleo background of the, of the uh, El Jasmine uh, Basin. Here you can see the, the background area of the, of, the, of the basin of Jasmine, 
which is characterized by a elongated rocky uh, ridge, which is divided, which is actually that divides the, the basin in two parts and is running almost perpendicular to the present day, present day sea, uh, the present day coastline. And if the Let's go to the just mean. You can see the bathymetry. The sediments are very, very, let's say, mobile at this at that area because we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of very strong long currents that modify uh, every day, every time the the sea floor. And now you can see the background below the the recent sediments, and you can see this rocky ridge. Then, actually, we combine our results with the onshore results published by, uh, by Martin Francis and Nicolas Grimard, and they discover a very nice basin on land. So, if we combine our paleobathymetry inside the bay and the data, on land data with the basin, we have a very nice harbor basin, very well protected from the north by the ancient town of Byblos and by the south by the El Zazmin, which was probably a tombolo at that time. <laughs> and you know that I'm, I'm very boring with the conclusions. So I prefer to go to go a trip back to time and you see the submarine landscape of Byblos and 12,000 years ago. I think that the science is the only way to go back in time and to the future, of course, yes. No comment for this. I'm not sure about this scenario, but I have to believe it. Because based on real data, hard data. And finally, I would like to thank deeply uh, Martin Francis, not only for the inspiration and the support during the survey, but uh, for her warm friendship, Nicola Grima for the amazing discussion on board, and of course, Horn of France Foundation that make this survey real. Thank you very much. Are you sure that it was nice? Or? Yes. <laughs> but how, how can like you it. choose where to focus if you don't have the chronology of the sediment? I mean, you, you obviously play with the subbottom profile and you obviously subjectively choose in which layer to, to just focus. What, what, what is the reason behind that? We have already some uh, dating data that is very well correlated with Dorit data. So actually, we're waiting for new two or three new the samples themselves, the, the themselves the yes. The yes. And, and we have we have a quite certain chronological framework, a local chronological framework from that area. Okay. You have you, you have to trust me. I'm allowed to my doubts. Okay, I can give you some details during the cafe. <laughs> Dimitris, no, no, I, I, I don't want a, a question for Dimitris. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> George, when you show the first map, uh, which uh, shows the, the two blocks which are further off. Uh, you, mean, you mean the plateau? The yeah, the two plateaus. plateaus ah. The two plateaus. Three, three plateaus. The shallow was at the 25, the second was at the 28. So the, sal the shallow one is the, the coastal plateau, let's say. No, and it's not. It's 20. Ah, the coastal, you mean that the zero? It's in continuation with it. Yes, okay. okay. And then you have two more plateaus, uh, slightly deeper. Yeah. 
For a structural geologist like me, this looks very look like a landslide. Two blocks who were split from the coastal plateau and slid downwards. Just as uh, an idea for you to thought. Thanks. Okay, dear Dimitris. Unfortunately, it's too much I, I was I was expecting a landslide at that area. So I have a lot of you, we have a lot of subbottom profi profiling data and no evidence about a submarine landslide. Unfortunately, for us, for two of us. Okay. One more. Yes, the, the, cost, the cost of Lebanon, the cost of Lebanon is actually characterized by a fragmentation all over the, the length of, of the coast. But our first preliminary datings are very, very compatible with uh, Dorit data, that, so we use it. Okay? Maria. Yes, of course. Yes, so you publish a very nice paper with all the data. Yeah, we published all yes. the Yes, we use it. Together with Christophe and some others. Yes, yes. About the fragmentation and the amount of uh, rise. Yes, of course. This is for the coast side, the coastal side. I would like to ask you later about the dendropoma that you mentioned. Ah, uh, the dendropoma, yes. In the coffee. Yes, okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Thanks. Just to, uh, to add some uh, small... I was wondering also about the dating of this sediment. You remove the layer of sediments. You know for sure the dating, the ages of these sediments? Because this is this difference from place to place. Based on the, on the land side uh, corings and the information? Yes, we have some first estimation that the deposition of the sediments the last two and a half thousand years was about, let's say, three or four meters. So we removed that, that sediment. Okay. Okay. Based on data. Based on, yes. Great. Thanks Great. a lot. So thanks again to Joe. <laughs> Thank you all, and uh, just when we want to thank all, and I would like to thank all the speakers of this uh, session. It was, uh, for, at least for me, a very, very interesting uh, session. Thanks a lot. We have a, um, a break now. We are exactly on time, although we started a little bit later. Do you want to take some, some gravels? Uh, no. I put it at the desk. Do you need to publish this? No, we are waiting for the different one of the Okay, this is... We collect some amazing people at the tip of the top.